Well, welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us uh, during today's webinar. We are so happy to have everyone here present and participating in a very exciting webinar uh, for today. We have the 3D printing webinar on onboarding and training 3D printing personnel in hospitals. And this webinar is going to be led by two fantastic speakers. We have Dr. Peter Leah Burris, who's a director of 3D medical applications and Walter Reed. He has years of experience and has been able to grow a lab. So he's been through the process of training and onboarding. We really look forward to his experience. We also have Dr. Beth Ripley, who is the Deputy Director of the Office of Healthcare and Innovation and Learning in the VA system, who has not just um, helped lead the 3D printing operations at her site, but also throughout the VA system, also bringing in a lot of personnel. So we thank our speakers for being present today. We wanna to remind everybody about who we are as the RSNA, we are a professional organization of radiologists and allied health personnel working in this field. And our mission is to promote excellence in patient care, healthcare delivery through education, research, and innovation. And we're gonna see that mission reflected in the 3D printing SIG group. Um, and our mission statement, this is our um, established mission statement. During our last business meeting, I want to remind everybody that we presented an expanded version so that we not only include 3D printing, but also additional immersive imaging such as AR and VR, but keeping our mission still focused on uh, the quality and safety and innovation in medicine through education and research. We encourage everybody to become a member and stay abreast on the updates on our activities, as well as participating in fantastic subcommittees, which are led by members of our community. We have the education subcommittee, the appropriateness subcommittee, and as well as the quality assurance and outreach. We also wanna take this opportunity to thank all of the membership and attendees that also participated in the recent CME meeting in Chicago. We wanna thank you for making this a success. And without further ado, we want to welcome our speakers, um, Dr. Leah Burris and Dr. Ripley. Fantastic. Thank you. As we're bringing up the slides, um, one thing that we're hoping to do today is make this really interactive. So um, any questions, comments, um, et cetera, from the audience throughout is very much welcomed. Um, and we'll be speaking today on onboarding and training 3D printing personnel in hospitals. And so if we go to the next slide, we'll talk about a little bit what the overview is. And again, this is gonna be a little bit different because this is sort of like a choose your own adventure depending on what space you have, what you wanna accomplish and where you are. So we're gonna take this a little bit more loosely and talk about major themes. So we're gonna go through First, identifying what your staffing needs are. Um, we're gonna share out a few current staffing examples from the VA and the DOD. We'll touch on training requirements and what's needed in that. Talk about how to leverage your existing hospital structure to, um, to build out the personnel in your lab. We'll touch briefly on QMS staffing needs um, and whether you will need that or not. And then finally, some creative ways to staff your team. All right, if we move on, we can uh, start to look at the identification of the staffing needs. Uh, your staffing needs will grow organically over time. Uh, it really depends on what applications and what goals you're driving to, uh, to accomplish for your lab. Uh, it depends what products you are producing currently and what you want to produce in the future. Uh, a big uh, thing is uh, dedicated versus part-time staff. And this really depends on the size and production of your facility. But once you add that first full-time staff member, it does seem to add a bit of legitimacy and consistency to your department. Uh, we know this is all tied to funding and... Uh, when you're moving along, funding is a big issue, especially for something that's not reimbursed within a hospital. So 
all the jobs, the titles versus their functions. This is something that's very interesting because you might have a job title that says director, but you're still going to be producing the models. You still might do be doing the segmentation, the printing setup, and even the cleaning because all these labs are small still at point of care. So you have to cross train through several different um, really tasks and processes in your facility. And, you know, that's a great point just to riff and we're going to just kind of riff back and forth. And again, ask questions if you have any, please. Um, one of the things that I didn't think about at first as we started to build out is, you know, when we started to get dedicated roles, it was like, fantastic. Okay. Now each person kind of has their lane. Um, but what you don't think about or what I didn't think about is vacations or sick days, et cetera. Um, and so you could quickly or conferences, you know, we've had um, issues about who can go to a conference or not, or can you be portable when you go? So again, that cross training function, I feel is really important, um, whether your lab is two or 10, or even, you know, upwards of 10 people, you're probably going to want to keep that cross training functionality in there. Yeah, one thing we do currently is we have a spreadsheet set up that we just completed recently. And it says, who's the primary, who's the secondary on each piece of equipment. We're going to further go into different roles and responsibilities for each position we have. Uh, but still, you should designate a primary person for each machine. And that person is in charge of, you know, the provider maintenance and just making sure the machine's clean, ready to use, turned over for the next build. This will help you just not have a, a question in your lab. Okay, who's going to set this machine up? Is it ready to go on to the next step? And then Beth said a lot of the other things, but even sick leave, when someone's out for multiple days, someone has to pick up the pieces of where they left off. So we'll start by going into our current structure. We're very lucky, I think, in both the DOD and VA to have a lot of different employees right now. This is our current structure. We have seven staff members that are all full-time devoted to 3D. Uh, I'm the director here. Uh, my background's biomedical engineering. And, but previously, we did have a dentist in charge of this and a radiologist in charge. The main difference was they also had other duties they were performing along with trying to run the lab. So once you have that full-time director, they have 100% dedicated time to the future of the lab and where this lab needs to grow. We also have another biomedical engineer on, on staff. She's actually a mechanical engineer by trade with previous FDA experience. That position was previously held by a metallurgist for one of our metal printers. So you can see things might change over time. Initially, we had the metal printer. We said, let's get someone who really knows the machine, really knows the material. Uh, eventually, he decided to leave for other pursuits. And then we said, well, maybe we need something with FDA experience for our quality management system. So then we said, let's bring in a different type of person into this role. We have two engineering technicians. They by trade are CT technicians, uh, both trained in the military. And they primarily handle the segmentation along with running all the machines on a daily basis. Uh, for CT technicians, they're already exposed to cross-sectional anatomy. So they already know the anatomy. You don't have to teach that again. We have one administrative staff uh, and we have one quality engineer. Uh, and we've had a couple different people in this position with various backgrounds. One has worked in a quality department in industry. One was in a master's program specializing on medical devices. So this is a interesting spot and this really depends on how the future is uh, dictated for us with future regulations. And then as our lab was growing, we saw we were doing a lot of dental models and we expanded into cobalt chrome. So we said we should bring on a dental technician. So we brought a dental technician into this 
position and he handles pretty much all the dental models we produce currently. We are also under the Department of Radiology, so access to a radiologist for a consultation, for a tumor case or anything we're not familiar with is just a phone call or email away. So that's a very important step, especially for the medical model steps. And if we move on to the VA staffing. Yeah, so in VA, it's been really interesting to watch how the different labs have been staffed up. So we have multiple sites throughout VA that have started somewhat organically. And one of the things that's a little bit um, different about VA is a lot of these started outside of a radiology department. So we have a little bit more of a, a diverse staff, um, which I think has been really fantastic and, and eye-opening uh, to the types of people that you can train in this space. I'm giving an example of one of our largest sites. This is our FDA registered site. And then I'll work my way backwards here for how I would downsize this for various lives, um, other labs. So like Pete said, we have a director, um, which is really kind of an icing on the cake position, I think. Um, it's great to have somebody that can interface with um, the administration, um, you know, argue for the business case, um, mentor the staff, et cetera. But, you know, in, in the end, you may or may not need that. That could be in other duties as a sign right now that is clinical staff. Um, but I see no reason why that couldn't be somebody else. Um, in that position. We also have an admin um, space, and a lot of this has to do with dealing with finances, again, the business, the hospital operations, and being able to interface on that space, as well as the HR and personnel actions. Again, that's a really nice to have, but potentially not a need to have, especially if you can tap into your hospital's existing admin, maybe in the radiology department, um, or in your executive leadership, or um, you know, front office department as well. Now we kind of get into like the weeds of where we really need boots on the ground. Um, so one decision is whether or not you want to do active product development, meaning you're coming up with something new um, that's not an existing turnkey solution. That decision um, carries a lot of um, weight in terms of requiring more FTE. And I found that that is our most demanding time um, and most demanding FTE need. Um, we have engineers um, predominantly in that space. And I think that is um, really adventitious to have that engineering background to understand product development. We also um, wanna have clinical staff in there um, to really drive the product um, development from that clinical perspective. Operations, I would say anyone can do this, anyone willing to learn. Um, and many of us on the call started as a one-man crew. That's how um, this VA lab started too, particularly um, as me, right? Like, so we all, we've all done that, but that means you've got to run the printers. So without an operations staff, I think you're kind of dead in the water. But again, the beauty here is that anyone can do it. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this um, as we go on. But for us, this could be a rehab engineer. This could be a sterile processing services tech that's been trained. Um, we have a maintenance mechanic um, that learned this job. Uh, it could be an artist. It could be a, you know, it could be almost anyone. So my suggestion is to look around for enthusiast, enthusiasm over um, experience in that space. Quality is a really hard position um, to fill. I've found, and I think Pete might agree with this, um, and it's because they're in such high demand, like a, a good quality engineer um, will always have a job. And so it's been somewhat difficult for us to hold people in just because of the salaries. This is just being completely transparent, right? The salaries that people can get on the private sector. So um, in, in this space, one thing that we've kind of pivoted to is like teaching our existing staff some of the aspects of this. Now you'd still need somebody to tap into. And that's one of the beauties I think of RSNA SIG or our community is that we could, you know, you can find experts to help mentor and train. Um, but for us, we've started to just kind of train up our existing staff in this space a little bit as well. 
Um, and, and that helps to keep them in place. Um, research is a nice to have, um, not a, a need to have per se, but also is an, an interesting way to, to staff up a lab. And some of our labs started that way out of research money. So having researchers on site um, can also be helpful. And then what we have finally is the digital team. And so that's all of our CAD based work. And again, engineers, um, imaging techs, clinical staff can all kind of be in that space. What have I missed, Pete? No, I, I think you caught everything. Um, so our structures are probably larger than most point of care hospital facilities right now. You're probably going to start off with maybe a director and an engineer or a director and a and a technician, but that does that director title, like we mentioned before, doesn't mean that director all he's doing is or all she's doing is paperwork. That means they're doing paperwork, they're doing segmentation, they're setting up the builds. Uh, then maybe the technician might be cleaning the bills, taking care of the machines, along with learning the segmentation as they develop. Uh, I think we've all been in, in a setup that is smaller, two, three individuals, and it, it will grow over time once your applications grow. But it's important to know that, yes, this can be reduced to a couple positions. And for a lot of hospitals, it's going to be one person doing everything at the beginning until they can train up or maybe even find a backup in another department uh, for when they want to take vacation. So if we move on to training requirements, this is very hard to uh, explain because for different jobs, you'll need different duties uh, and different experiences. Currently, there's no certifications uh, for 3D printing at point of care. I know there is a certificate or maybe two certificates out of two different uh, institutions, but there's no certification that says, okay, you are certified to produce these models at the point of care. And this probably is because the applications are so vast. A lot of our labs go from medical models to limb prosthetics to simulation models. And it's hard to really certify a lab to do everything. Uh, so there's a lot of different things, like we said, and Beth said, you can leverage from your radiologists to your engineers. We've all hired people with different backgrounds, and we know people who run labs with different backgrounds. We know artists that, that uh, run labs. We know graphic designers that have, you know, uh, progressed in the field to run labs. We know people who were in the video game uh, design area, um, the Hollywood special effects area. There's people that have joined 3D labs from all these different areas. And sometimes leveraging what's already in your facility too. You may say, okay, well, you see potential in someone in another field, like our dental technician. He was very skilled in in some of the digital aspects along with silicone molding. So I said, we need a dental technician to come over. So when he retired from the military, we hired him on in our lab. So there's other technicians that may not want to be a CT technician or be a dental technician, but have that urge for digital technology and want to progress into this field. So that's always a place you can look and they'll have some skills so you won't have to train them up on everything. The other thing that I would say you can utilize are your software and hardware contracts. A lot of these include training or updates to the training in them. So look at these contracts, especially for these expensive software programs and hardware programs you have, because you may be entitled to training once a year on the updates. You may be entitled to new user trainings for your equipment. Um, so you can have, when a new staff member joins, you may have two uh, training opportunities to send them to training that's included in your contract. And of course, webinars, meetings, I would hold on to all your old training manuals. We just pass some of these on to uh, department in dentistry where they're going to try and train some staff uh, on some different programs. And there's a vast amount of tutorials, even online. You can find tutorials for free for CAD programs and other programs out there that, that are just very useful. What did I miss here, Beth? 
No, I, th I think you you hit hit most of the points. Of course, also RSNA SIG, just the shameful shameless plug, is a great place too, right? To learn um, training and other uh, you know pieces of information, and just again leveraging the community. I think Pete and I are always happy to answer questions, as are other VA and DoD staff, and you know other hospitals as well. And it but a lot matter. of it, a lot of it is just kind of on the job training, honestly. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter how experienced the person is. Like I learn stuff from new users sometimes that I said, oh, I never thought about doing it that way. So don't think since you're new in the field that you don't know anything. I mean, there there's tips and tricks that can be applied across the gamut of experience levels. And I guess the... One other thing I'll say, we'll, we'll go to this slide, but one other thing I'll say is, you know, if you're kind of weighing between somebody, if you're trying to hire somebody and you're weighing between somebody that has existing experience some, versus someone who has boundless enthusiasm and willingness to learn, I would always pick the enthusiasm and willingness to learn because the technologies um, are changing so fast anyways that, you know, the knowledge we have from a few years ago may be obsolete anyways, and you there's no way to train people to have that love of learning. And, and I know I'm saying something that's obvious, um, but I think it it really comes to play in this field more than some others, that it's okay to to take a risk on somebody that doesn't know and is willing to learn because there, there are a lot of resources out there. And that goes into kind of this next point, which is how can you beg, borrow, um, and steal from the existing hospital infrastructure and, and what you may have there. So um, things to think about is who has excess capacity and is enthusiastic about what you're doing that might be able to help. So admin staff, contracting officers, um, and others in that space, you know, just being able to, to talk to people, of course, with their supervisor's permission and approval, but, you know, there may be opportunities um, to partner up and kind of borrow some time from people in that space. Um, if you have a biomed or clinical engineering service, you know, um, the people that are working on your PAC system, the CT scanners, et cetera, they may be interested um, in spending some time and helping out. And so that's also a really great resource to tap into. Um, in-house building engineers, electricians, et cetera, setting up a space is really challenging. And that's something that you're probably not going to bring a, a dedicated staff member on. So again, just being able to find out who in your hospital might be able to help with that. Um, for us, the, the sterilization um, services has been incredibly important um, as a, a partner and a resource and being able to, to go and talk to them and, and gain some insight and knowledge from them. And then, you know, just don't forget about all, all the other pieces like the hospital waste removal, gas supply, um, these are people that it's really important to be good friends with um, and can really help out um, in your lab. And again, probably not somebody you have dedicated um, resources to hire, but if you can get them even to spend like a week or sorry, a, an hour every couple weeks thinking about your lab and helping out, it could be huge. Same for safety and fire. And then always um, every hospital has a uh, quality department. Um, and now I know it's not the same as what we do in manufacturing, but a lot of the concepts are the same. And it comes down to that element of just understanding risk and benefit and maximizing benefit to patients. And the what quality department knows people. Like if you need to find someone, they're always a great department to reach out to because they're like, oh, you should contact this person in this department. They know about this or, or they know everyone because they're worried about the quality and the risk to the patient, not the quality and risk of the device, but the risk to the patient uh, and all the patient care applications, which is a little different, but yes, they're a great resource to know. Uh, in our facility, we do have safety and fire inspections at least once a year. So you get to ping questions off of them, especially the fire. When you get in, if you're going to get into metals, you need to talk to your fire department uh, just to see different things. 
I always have the question on, oh, how do you dispose of this waste uh, from one of the machines? And I'm like, we just call our waste person and and they come pick it up. We print out the uh, material data and safety sheet and they just come pick it up. So you are very lucky to be in a hospital because a lot of these things are already there. Like the, the waste disposal is there. Hospital has numerous machines that need gas supply. So for metal machines, you need a gas supply. You might need um, cylinders of, we have cylinders of helium and cylinders of argon, but this has already been set up. So you can just add on to that. You don't have to waste your time to figure out how you're going to create a contract for gas or waste disposal because the hospital already has that set up. The other thing that, that we don't have here is just, uh, I don't have a name for it. Uh, we call it like central supplies of the hospital. Uh, and you can a lot of times get those supplies through the hospital, uh, little basins to clean your models or put your models in, uh, napkins, chucks, all these different supplies that are way cheaper because the hospital buys them in such bulk that you can use your funds to buy those at almost a fraction of the cost you would if you were to buy those on the outside. And the nice part about those are a lot of the, those are already certified by the hospital and those are already controlled vendors through the hospital. So you know you're getting the same type of quality on these supplies every time. The great thing here too um, is these may become future employees if they get really interested. Um, and we always, if we're asking for help, we always offer a tour um, of the lab, um, which they don't have to do, but almost everyone takes us up on it. And I think getting people excited about what's going on um, really helps them to be willing to donate an hour here or there. And, and you can get a lot of FTE just this way. Um, you know, in, in small chunks for these expertise areas. Yeah, I, I, we're the same way. I feel like that's, that's crucial because someone's always more willing to help you when they see the benefit you're providing to the patients. Um, if we move on, this is kind of the hard slide to go over because as these labs keep developing and as regulation keeps evolving, these labs may need some formal quality management systems or some formal quality control, good manufacturing practices in-house. Uh, this is, like Beth said, the hardest position to fill and very specific right now in additive manufacturing, quality engineers don't grow on trees here. And other ones, if you steal other ones from other medical um, applications and, and other medical production, they may be very, um, what's the right word, reliant on what they did previously. An additive is very different from everything they may have uh, produced previously from different manufacturing process. There's a lot of intricacies to additive that don't exist in other manufacturing processes. So because of this, our initial philosophy here at where I work was to bring on someone younger in the field that's more adaptive to, to making the system work the way we want it to work. Uh, but Beth also has some seasoned people at, at the VA, so we can always reach out to them and say, okay, well, what are we missing? What did we do right? What did we do wrong? So this is a very hard uh, thing to do. And the way I think of this is you should just start your documentation process. Beth, what do you have to add on this? Yeah, I would say one of... Um... Yeah, this is extremely challenging, but one of our rising stars in this space um, is actually an occupational therapist by trade. And she just got really interested in this. And um, this is this is Annika Levine. She's fantastic. Um, she she. 
probably regrets this to this day, but offered to write our first 510k application, which I think was probably like a living nightmare for her, but she learned a ton. Um, and she is just whip smart in this. Um, and so this is why, why I'm advocating, you know, fiercely too, that you can try, you hire people, but it's also great to invest in staff that may be interested in this and can learn. And I think, you know, some of the resources that she's tapped into is just talking to experts um, on demand, uh, but also, you know, there's some good FDA resources. There's an FDA course that she went to um, about like kind of regulatory boot camp and some other webinars. Um, and she has some great resources too that, that we could share out um, with the SIG group here. So, you know, again, and she's teaching me, so I'm like slowly learning too. But I think, again, having an expert, but this, some of this can be taught and learned. Yeah. And, and going back to training and developing your staff, when you start documenting everything, you're going to have your work instructions documented. But when you have your work instructions actually documented and they're not inside someone's head, well, it's easier to train because... You just say, okay, we'll reference this work instruction on how to create this medical model or prosthetic device. And then if you have any questions, come to me or come to another person in the lab. Uh, so this really formalizes some of your training as you're documenting everything. I think this is critical too. This is something I did not do and I really regret it when I was a lab of one or maybe a lab of two because everything is in my head, right? Um, and in my my colleague's head. And so we we knew it. So why would we write it down? But as we've tried to like transition out of some of those roles and bring people in, um, all of that knowledge that we had in our heads is not easily translatable, it turns out. And so the biggest piece of advice I probably would give to, to new labs is if you're you know, doing the lion's share, start writing it down, even if it feels silly, because one day you will have staff. Um, and one thing that we've seen is a lot of fantastic labs that completely like implode if that the champion leaves. And so then you're left with a hospital with, you know, printers and materials and no one to run it. And the way you protect against that is that succession planning um, of writing things down. So I know it's, arduous, but I think it's so worthwhile. Yeah, there's no possible way you can teach, you know, years of you troubleshooting a machine in a couple days to a person. Uh, you know, it still comes up where, oh, well, we're having this problem. And then someone will be like, well, did you try this, this or this? Uh, but if you had that documented, it it just helps. So that's one thing I would recommend. We've all been there probably where we don't document as well as we should. And now we're all trying to catch up to uh, formalize our documentation. Uh, creative ways to staff your lab. Uh, Beth has a lot of these, so I'll, I'll turn this over to her in a bit. But one of the things we do, and we're trying a few different things, uh, I always take on at least one or two summer students Usually it's an unpaid position, unfortunately. Uh, they're usually in high school or college uh, that are interested in the field. Uh, this allows us to do a lot of different things. If we have some projects, they can help us develop or just some CAD models for simulation models. This is way easier to do on things that don't involve patient data, of course. So if it's a simulation model, that's way easier. Uh, also, with a lot of college students, they can get CAD programs for very cheap through their university. So a lot of them already have this installed on their laptops. So you don't have to provide them with a laptop. And they can actually work at home some of the time, too, because we know desks are also at a premium with a lot of these labs. We are trying to integrate with some other departments. Uh, one thing we're trying to do right now is with the maxillofacial prosthetics department, we're trying to integrate and help train some of their staff to be backups for us. And we also have other medical staff. Our transplant surgeon comes in 
probably every other week to work on segmentation or work with one of our um, engineering technicians on one of his upcoming procedures. One of the things on here that, that we've made use of is bringing in contract staff, um, which could be, you know, off of just, you know, a typical like labor contract, but also um, potentially, you know, off of an OEM or other um, 3D printing business um, contract where you bring in staff. Um, one of the challenges that I, I know is definitely in the government space, but I think it's for all hospitals is when you hire on staff, um, that's, you know, for forevers, right? Or, or for a long time, again, you know, this, it, it may be a little bit different in the hospital, in, depending on what your um, policies are, but knowing that you're going to have money to support someone year over year may be challenging when you're starting up. Um, and that was really hard for me um, to think about hiring somebody um, that I might not be able to pay for. So sometimes it makes sense to bring in contract staff, um, you know, because those are made for discrete periods of time. You know, you can say three months or six months or or 12 months. It's probably a little bit more expensive. But again, it, from a business and fiscal planning perspective, that may make more sense. Um, if you have to hire somebody for, we call it like an NTE or not to exceed, like if you're offering a job for just like one year, um, that can be challenging as well. And so I think you have to think about who, who's likely to take that type of job or that might change how you're recruiting for that position. Um, I was told in the past, like several years ago, that a lot of, um, young engineers in our particular area were willing to do that because they were interested in, in moving from job to job and it wasn't um, seen as an issue so much. But I think, you know, as we look at how, you know, economy changes, et cetera, that may or may not be the case. So that's just something I wanted to bring up front to think about um, before you get too excited and hire and you're stuck with, you know, a really kind of, um, sticky situation if you can't continue to pay someone yeah uh, a lot of times in, in my institution that's how staff usually has to start they usually start as a contract staff member uh and then over time you'll show the justification for why you need to retain them uh work on a, a change of workforce plan and then from there you can really have if they're research or off a grant, then you'll have them transferred to the department. And then eventually you'll have them transferred into hospital staff. But usually that for us, this is a multi-year process. It's just not one of those things that say, hey, you want another staff member? No, we have to prove it out, have the sustainment plan in place and almost function for one to three years before we can even approach that subject of converting them to official hospital employee. It's just how it, it goes and it, it kind of organically grows over time. Another thing I didn't realize um, when I started off in this space is depending on your hospital and your HR and, and hiring, there may or may not be the right job description to fit um, the work that we want to do. Most likely there probably is not. Um, and then the question becomes, what is closest to it? Now, if you have, if you're like a very progressive or dynamic or agile um, institution, you may just be able to say, hey, I want to make a 3D printing engineer job and, you know, bing, bang, you've got it. Um, for us, it doesn't work that way. So it was a lot of extra effort to try to map the types of skills we needed onto existing jobs. So I just bring that up as, as something to think about as you're thinking about staffing up your hospital is, is what is the requirement going to be for that job description and who can fit into it? Yeah, even when we were starting out, um, our biomedical engineer job description wasn't really the 
built for someone who studied biomedical engineering in college and grad school. It was built for our clinical engineers who take care of the equipment and take care of the service contracts. They would call them uh, biomedical engineers. Uh, so that's how that was built out. Um, so we still use that, but it, it was really a change in our job description to include you know, biomedical engineers, that that's what they went to school for. That's what they studied. And then the other thing that I utilized was the engineering technician job already existed. So I was able to leverage that for the CT technicians uh, and bring them on as engineering technicians. So this is just some visual vignettes from from Beth showing different uh, people that came from other departments, actually. This was actually one of the best things that we did. Um, and this, we did this during COVID, um, which is why they have swabs. Um, but we looked around for, you know, who, who had more capacity or time. Um, and since we had to shut down a lot of elective surgeries, there was more time in the sterile processing services um, department, as well as some extra um, manpower in our maintenance mechanics department. So what we did was a four, four month internship, and we brought over two sterile processing services techs and two maintenance mechanics, and just like threw them into the lab to learn. Um, and our maintenance mechanics um, here to the two in the middle um, learned on a powder bed fusion. And then our SPS techs came in to make swabs on um, that photopolymerization. Um, and, you know, it was a win, win, win because it gave them something to do. They were excited. Um, those programs um, sent over like kind of their, their stars as a reward, right. To have to do something fun. Um, and then you know, we were able to hire three out of the four of them and bring them over as full-time staff. Um, and we learned a ton because, you know, again, bringing in the SPS techs, we learned everything that they're doing in that space. And it really boosted um, the, the um, quality of what we're doing. And actually one of them is a, our quality tech now. Um, she's fantastic, Ruth, um, and really brought that, that knowledge over. Um, and Matt is like running a lot of our printers. Um, and then Todd, who's here in the, the middle, uh, second over from the radiologist right, um, is running our powder bed, but also like just knows how to fix everything. And he is like an ace in the hole and, and doing safety too. Um, so I thought this was one of our most successful ways of bringing in existing staff and really growing like our talent pool by reaching into those different job descriptions that you might not have immediately thought of for the lab. Thank you. One more. Um, and then the, the other one is fellowships. Um, so we've been running, this is, um, this is one of my favorite surgeons over here, Mike Amendola on the radiologist right. Um, and he is a vascular surgeon out of Richmond, and he's been running a 3D printing fellowship program for uh, surgical fellows over the past three years. I think we're in year three or four now. Um, and this is another great way to bring in, you know, extra um, brain power and might. And so the fellows are learning segmentation with us. Um, they're interfacing with all the surgeons, um, doing a ton of you know, um, teaching and training and presentations. Um, and that's really boosted our productivity. And then of course, we also hope to, to bring them on board, right in the future. And, or maybe you're going to bring them on board in, in your hospital. Now, this is not an ACGME fellowship, which is really hard to do, but we've done this as an elective fellowship. Um, I think this is something we can do in a lot of radiology departments with that kind of um, fifth year, um, that's sort of a flex year. And it also works well with surgeons who often have a research year um, in the middle of their training to do, a, you know, an informal fellowship. And so that's, that's just another way of, of staffing up that I think has been uh, working particularly well for us.
Yeah, I was going to hit on that uh, research month or research year, whatever they uh, have. Sometimes we've had surgeons, radiologists come in and try and do projects with us over that research uh, time. I try and say this at every tour I give uh, because you you walk through the department, you see these beautiful pieces of equipment, you see all the great things that you're producing, but none of this can be done without your staff. Your staff's your most important resource out of everything you have in a lab because if you don't have the staff to run everything, you have a lot of paperweights is what I like to say. So I, I don't know. Do you have any? Last words on the staffing, Beth? No, um, I think that said well. I will say there was a, a question in the chat about what the FDA regulatory um, course was. So I dropped a link in the chat. I'm just making sure everyone can see it in the Q&A. Um, it was called Survivor, the, the FDA 510K program edition offered by the Regulatory Affairs Professional Society. Um, and so that, that was that resource. And I don't know if others have questions. We would love to answer questions. This is a hard topic because it's um, really um, sort of nuanced depending on, on what you need. So please ask questions. And I don't know if people can come off mute to ask questions or if they just need to type them. So um, if if I can take advantage of not yeah. having to be so to be able to be uh, unmuted, I have a question for you, Pete. Um, you mentioned basically a structure of about seven staff members, and we understand the size of your lab has both um, certified printers and printers that are not registered with the FDA. Does that have an influence in how your staffing model has grown? Um, so, yeah, it's it's first off, the registered with the FDA is a little weird to say. So the facility will become registered with the FDA, but the printers will be incorporated into your quality management system, but the printers themselves will not be registered. Uh, so the facilities registered, but the printers themselves all have stickers, whether it's in the quality management system or outside the quality management system. Uh, this is very important to do when you're implementing your quality management system. So you know what exactly pieces of equipment you've gone through the certain steps uh, in accordance to the regulations such as IQ, OQPQ, and any of your validations and verification procedures. Um, so they all have stickers. And yes, this does impact how you're staffing. Not everything, but once, I believe, once you start implementing the quality system, you need someone almost full time to handle the quality system. So it doesn't impact the staffing for the other positions as much, but it does add a staff member. Um, and this is, this is a hard thing to do, especially when you have staff members that have been around for so long. And then you're saying, okay, well, we're gonna try and change a lot of how we were doing things uh, in correspondence so we can implement this quality management system. You're gonna get a lot of questions. Why are you be doing this? This seems like overkill, but it also helps with all that documentation. And when you do have that staff turnover in the future, you'll have a uh, designated workflow for them. So our, our plan right now is to start at our highest risk device and then work backwards. And hopefully we'll have better understanding of what the FDA will expect from point of care uh, in the near future. So then we can structure everything we do to the, uh, if they make new regulations or more than likely it will be a guidance document that comes out first. And so we have another question in the chat uh, from Catherine. And she asks, as a new graduate in this field, what are the best ways to find leads in the point of care 3D printing job section? That is a, a great question. I think 
a lot of people, well, first of all, if you're ever, if you're ever interested um, in a government job, um, you have to go to, what is it? Your, uh, USA job study. Jobs. Yes. Yeah. Um, and maybe I'll find that and put it in a link because there's actually a lot of jobs um, in the government space in 3D printing. Um, and you may not think to go to that site. So I'm going to add that. But then also, you know, My computer's going crazy as I'm trying to find that. As you say that, uh, the other leads, I would say off the bat, are you have conferences, you have different user groups too. I mean, we're, we're presenting at one 3D printing group for medical 3D printing right, right here. Um, webinars, reaching out to people, there, there's you know, social media too, you can track down people. Uh, most people I know in the field are very happy to answer any types of emails um, or even talk to you for a little bit. So there's a lot of different resources out there. There are some, some other, if you're looking for point of care, that's a little different than actual the medical manufacturers, but there's a lot of medical manufacturers that that uh, also uh, have a business for 3D printing, both models, guides, and implants. One thing I did want to reiterate, I mean, Pete and I showed kind of like the, the more mature lab, but I just want to reiterate that we all start as a lab of one, um, and one or two people can do quite a lot. Um, but you're either never going to sleep, or you're going to have to like really kind of narrow and focus it in. And that's why we mentioned at the beginning, really having a clear idea of what you want to accomplish and what's the most important thing is is really important for staffing. Um, and then you know, as you grow and add another person or two, um, you can start to like widen your offerings. But really that jump up is if you're doing something that's regulated or running under a QMS, you probably like you, you can't do it with less than three people. There's, I just think there's just no way. Um, so that's and one I, of those decisions. Let me add on something else here. Um, when you're starting out small too, and setting those expectations too. That's another thing that can, you know, put you in a staffing situation at a later date too. If, if you're saying I can have a model or this part to you in 24 hours, that's different from saying, hey, we need a three-day window to produce any normal case. If you're saying 24 hours, that's a different staffing need. You might have to have people that are working overtime or working different shifts. If you have a piece where you say, oh, normal turnaround time is three to five days, then those expectations are known. Uh, if it's an emergency case, of course, you still will do it, but you have to say, if this is an emergency case, I need you not only to put the order in through our ordering system, but give us a call so we know we have to dedicate a staff member to this right away and pull them from a different project that has a later due date. So that that's very important when you're looking at your staffing uh, profile. That's such a great point, Pete. Um, and something that just came up last week for us when we were trying to think about that window of turnaround time, you know, and we have a product right now that has a, a 10 day window of turnaround time. Now we're shipping things, et cetera, but you know, we're like, oh, wouldn't it be nice to <clears throat> tighten that in? Um, and you know, for me. I'm like, oh yeah, let's just, let's do it faster, right? And then they're saying, well, let's sit down and actually think about what that means for the printer, for the staff, for the people. And, you know, even changing it by three days meant, you know, another machine and or like a swing stiff, swing shift staff to work nights. And so, you know, some of these things don't seem as impactful as they actually are. Um, so that is a great way to be able to run with small staff is to set larger windows. That also allows you some space to be sick for a day. Um, 
But yeah, if you promise out of the gate 24 hour turnaround time with like two people, not only are you not sleeping, but also you may find yourself in a situation where when you try to advocate for more staff, they're like, well, why should we, you know, we're already getting what we want. Um, and it's harder to say, well, it's not sustainable versus kind of setting that expectation up front. And I say that knowing that's a hard thing to say, because we're trying to like hustle and get, you know, excitement and we want to say yes, but sometimes that, that short term yes may, um, make it harder for us in the long term to advocate for what we really need to be successful. And so a question, Pete, on how you guys reach out on your clinical cases to your radiology colleagues. How do you guys determine the cases that you reach out to? And what is the level of support that you're able to receive in turn? Uh, it's, it's usually pretty quick. Uh, the day or the, the next day. Um, the things we reach out the most are our tumor cases. There, we didn't study radiology for eight years. We didn't do the residency. When, when we get a tumor case and it's not clear as day where, where the margins are, or they don't have that dictated in the PAC system, uh, we'll reach out for a consult. Uh, it's very easy for us since we're in the Department of Radiology. I usually just make a phone call or, or a quick email and we'll have someone up within a day or two. A lot of the bone models, if we have a complex fracture, bone shows up as bone on a, on a CT. They're pretty straightforward. So we don't have a consult on a lot of those, but the tumor cases are our main consult. A lot of soft tissue models. When you get into soft tissue, I think that's where you you start to have more consults. Sometimes on the vascular cases, if we lose a vessel or they wanted us to try and track a nerve bundle, we'll definitely ask for a consult because they're tracking things our eyes aren't used to seeing on, on these scans. So those are the main things we'll, we'll ask for a consult on. Well, I know we're at the top of the hour. I wanted to say thank you to everyone um, for joining in and asking questions. And um, I think Pete and I are happy to answer any other questions you may have offline and um, it's, it's always exciting to be growing the lab and bringing in new people. And it's also a, a challenge and we know that. So um, we're here to support and learn from you too. So if you have successes or lessons learned, please share them so that we can incorporate them into, into future talks, et cetera. All right. Thanks for having us.